Please welcome the Academy Award nominee, Mr. Don Hahn. singing uh, together, uh, Let It Go from Frozen. <laughs> That's just an inappropriate thing to say. <laughs> this movie is so special to um, everyone in the audience, certainly the people that worked on it, and it's the 21st anniversary of this movie showing right here. Woo! Woo! Pretty cool. And to celebrate, I always thought it would be one of the most exciting things about stop-motion animation is to tour through a stop-motion studio and see the puppets being built, see the sets being built, and have a feeling for what it's like. It's kind of like touring through Santa's workshop. It's amazing. And I wish I could take each and every one of you by the hand and just walk you through that process. And then we got to thinking, well, why don't we? So tonight, <coughs> we brought the studio to you here on the stage at the El Capitan. some of the most amazing artists, animators, designers in the stop motion field today, simply the superstars of stop motion, to tour you through the studio of Nightmare Before Christmas. Let's take a look. They've been here all night, actually, sculpting for us. Yeah. So, we're going to talk a little bit about everything. We have some of the actual sets and puppets from the show, and we're going to start out talking about the process of animation. And what we're going to do is, while we're walking through, we have a, a Tom, our cameraman, is going to be on stage, so you can actually see really close what we're doing and get in close to what the puppet makers are doing and the animators are doing. This is what I call the superstars of stop motion animation, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Starting with the lovely and talented Allison Abadi. <laughs> so here's the thing, Allison has uh, worked on all of my beloved stop motion films. For example, she produced films like Corpse Bride. <laughs> and how about she also produced Fantastic Mr. Fox. And she also produced Frank and Wayne. And she was also associated with a small movie earlier this year called The Lego Movie. I want you to talk a little bit about story and how this all starts. How do you start a movie like that before Christmas? Okay. Um, well, Nightmare Before Christmas, I just want to say, was like the second movie I ever worked on, and I was, uh, I, my job was the artistic coordinator, which meant I had to look after a whole bunch of different departments. I mean, one of those departments was the story department. And I think a lot of you are familiar with the kind of storyboarding. We, we were lucky on that movie because first we had Tim's drawings and his story. Um, and then we had Danny's gorgeous music and songs, and those were kind of already sort of worked out when we started. Of course, it's all the rest of the movie that we had to do. So, you know, as in all uh, the movies, you start to kind of come up with ideas and flesh it out and, and take the script and kind of draw pictures and make it come to life. Um, so we did that. And, you know, one of the things I love about stop motion, which I think is a little bit different than other things, is that if you put something in the storyboard, somebody has to make it. And they have to make it really small and they have to make it work and they have to make it kind of end up. And so it's always really important to, to yeah, know yeah. what's, you know, to get kicked to the cognizant of what's going into your story. Yeah, yeah. And um, what John has brought today is an example of something that we boarded and then we didn't actually make. So, so this is actually not in the movie, but it's a little piece of storyboard, not in the show. Yeah, but it doesn't show you kind of that we have to do a whole bunch of different ones before we kind of come up with the, with the shit that we're doing. So, John is going to actually... Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to attempt to pitch this storyboard to you all, and Tom's going to get in close so you can see it. Voices with funny voices, <laughs> some of which are my own. 
<laughs> this is a scene that was cut out of the very end of the movie. It was an alternate ending to the movie. And it starts with Oogie Boogie way up on top of the spire up here. We hear rip, and his arm comes off, and then rip, and his whole costume comes off. And we just see the doctor standing up there with his little Oogie Boogie head. And we look, and he's holding it up, and he says, Now you've done it, Jack. You meddling stick figure. And Jack's confused. We look over, and we see Sally. You've crossed the line now, Jack. And Santa looks up. Go back to the doctor. He says, the evil scientist says, uh, I'm Oogie Boogie. You haven't beaten me. There's no monster scarier, meaner, and hungrier than I am. <laughs> Look back and see, it's just him. And Jack says, Dr. Finkelstein, what are you doing? And he holds up his mask and says, Yes, Jack, it's me. It's me, the man who created Sally from bits of flesh and scraps of cloth. And he looks down again and says, But you love you, Jack. You're, you're oblivious, you. Oblivious twitch. He points down into her. He looks up at him, and Sally looks over at Jack. And then we see the scientist again say, As Oogie Boogie, I wanted to teach her a lesson that she'd never forget. I'm through with the both of you. I'm going to make myself uh, a new creature, someone who will appreciate me for who I am. Igor? And the door opens down below, and you see a little door open, and you see Master, and he goes down below, and this little forklift comes up and grabs him. And he says, Farewell, little Jack Skellington, and he gets pulled down below. So that's a little piece of the movie that was not here. Uh, <laughs> it kind of messes with my head that, that Dr. Finkelstein is actually a Boogie, but it, it's, it has so many things mess with it. my head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Allison. We're going to um, go over now to the next gentleman, and we're going to kind of move over to talk about the puppets next. Uh, next for you on stage, we're so proud and happy to have with us Ruben Procopio. Now, Ruben, yes. You've been sculpting for Disney for uh, many years, I would say 30, 35? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> 35 years. Um, and have worked on films like uh, Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and, and many, many others. And today you're here sculpting for us the Jackhead because you also sculpt these absolutely incredible figures for the Disney collectibles line. And about an hour ago, this sculpture of Jack didn't exist. It was just clay in an art supply store. So if you ever need a sculpture at your birthday party, call it Ruben. Um, tell us a little about what you're doing, and then we'll take a really close look at your, your sculpture. Well, um, what I'm doing here is uh, a, a 3D model, a traditional sculpture of, of Jack. Um, uh, way back uh, in the Disney history there, Joe Grant and uh, uh, at the Disney Studios back in the 30s, 40s, had uh, created the model department, and they used to create these maquettes for the animated uh, movies. And uh, along the lines there, uh, they stopped making them. And uh, back in the 80s, and in fact, uh, you were instrumental in helping me do this, uh, to bringing them back. Um, we, we started bringing them back at Fox and the Hound, and uh, uh, Great Mouse Detective, and, and uh, Little Mermaid, and Lion King. Those movies, and so uh, I think of, of maquettes and these sculptors, uh, sculptures as uh, another tool for the animators. Um, I, they got the paper, pencil, model sheet, and a maquette. And early on in the process, when you're designing characters, what would these be used for? Are they like for inspiration or? Uh, absolutely. Uh, in early stages, um, when we're exploring the characters. Uh, it's, the supervising animators come up with many drawings, and uh, many times uh, they are uh, ten different versions of a particular character. So uh, there were situations where I would get ten different versions of, 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 of a character, and I'd have to come up with something. Then call the director, producer, and the animator into the office and say, "Okay, how does this look?" And uh, uh, many times it would be okay, and then other times it would be a complete do-over. Um, a great example of this was uh, with Beast. Uh, when we could view the Beast, you all came in, and then uh, after you left the office, I actually called Blaine King back over because uh, he was the supervising editor on Beast. And we actually sat down for about an hour or so and then came up with what you know and looked the final show. What materials are you using? Clay, or is it some sort of. Uh, 
This is a, a polymer clay uh, called Sculpty. Um, it's great because you can do any uh, sculpture, craft, whatever, and then put in the oven and bake it. Oh, really? It becomes hard, yes. Okay, good. So, so there's only one Sculpty tonight. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can you tell us a little about your, your work for uh, the Disney Collectible Editions and, and get over and get a close look at these because they're amazing? How do you approach these? Do you, do you do the same thing? Do you have different kinds of clay? Do you have different kinds of how do you approach these? Do you do the same thing with an armature and sculpting and clay, or how do you approach those things? I do, and, I, 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 and actually there's a, a variety of ways. This particular piece here, the pumpkin king with behemoth, was done traditionally all by hand, um, and actually was about twice as, as big as what you see here, because this is a porcelain piece, and the process of actually shrinks. Now the Sally over there, um, that's uh, for electric tiki, and that was uh, done uh, digitally. So I sculpted it on the computer. Really? Yes. Uh -huh. I learned how to do them both. And uh, one complements the other, so you bring all the traditional uh, so attributes of, you know. You sculpted that in the, the cell in the computer, and it then is. is it like a, a, a printer then that prints it out? Yes. Uh -huh. it, it, it's amazing because you send a file to a printer, you can be a printer anywhere in the world, and then about two weeks later, it shows up on your doorstep. It's amazing. Uh, yes. So uh, that's, that was, uh, since the file is done digitally, you can tell it whatever size you want. Mm -hmm. In this case, I had to do it a specific size, but with the file, you could do it a monument if you want. So, so to work in the industry now, you're working in play, you're working in sculpting, you're working in a digital format, no matter what it takes to get the job done. Correct. Uh, keeping up with the time. Yes, you are. This first sculpture here is called the Pumpkin King, and we had trouble getting it for you tonight because the only one we could find was for sale on eBay for many thousands of dollars. So, <laughs> thanks to uh, Ruben for bringing them along with you. You're welcome. That's good. Thank you. Directed one of my favorite cool big epic Disney movies called Dinosaur. And, yeah, and he's been uh, a supervising animator on lots of other movies. I think of you, I think of uh, King Kong, I think of many things that he's worked on, uh, including Nightmare Before Christmas, the supervising animator of Nightmare Before Christmas, Eric Layton, ladies and gentlemen. A little bit here. Um, Allison was kind enough to bring in some, some amazing uh, works of art from the films that she's worked on, including uh, this is Sally, actually, without her clothes on. Um, and this is this is the most important thing to the animator is actually what's inside for the art department, for the character designers, for the sculptors. They're all concerned with what's on the outside. Ultimately, the audience is too. But we don't have a magnificent um, uh, movable armature on the inside, then the animators are in trouble because they can't actually make it perform. So know? when we see a puppet on the screen, we're seeing the clothing and the, and the you're, you're, around you're, it, but on the seeing all of this, yes. Right, on the inside, it's a fully articulated little steel skeleton. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And it, it, you know, if it's a background puppet, it may just be made out of wire and, and a bunch of foam put on top. But for right. something like Sally, uh, then you have a, a incredibly precise, every one of these bits here is made by hand, by a machinist, um, to, 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 you know, be as smooth as possible to move it around. Um, then you put, you know, whatever you need to, to put on top to get the puppet built up. So you may have some foam, you may have a dress to put on top, you may have some hair, you put some lead in Sally's hair to make it move around. Um, Sally in particular also has a replacement face series. Some puppets have articulated like armatures right, underneath. Right. Other ones you just pop the face off like sorry Sam. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that's 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 what you that's disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well it's much less disturbing this way than the body. Yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> And what are these, these other puppets here, uh, Alice? You brought up some puppets that are yeah. extraordinary here uh, next to Eric. Yeah, these are. This is from uh, the Old Corpse Bride, uh, which uh, I just wanted to um, kind of just see the progression of puppets from for all sorts of movies. Um, these are very um, you know, articulated faces that I did not because it's so complicated. They're like little Swiss watches on the inside, and you put an element in the top of it, and that was amazing. 
Um, and then a few years later, we decided, one of the compliments we got in Culture Department was people said, oh, that looks so good, look at the CGI. And we were like, OK, no, 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 no. So um, Tim was very adamant to say, next we wanted to do like stuff. So these are the Franco and the Franco So And just to be clear, these are the actual, if I were to go to the Franco you right now, these are the guys that run the screen. Yes, this is Sparky. So, movie stars, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just to show you that, that you know, like, like Eric was talking about the um, armature inside of Sally, they all have armatures inside of them. So like, that's why you can move it kind of one third at a time and it will hold its position. So these are that with stuff on top. Um, but okay. speaking of armatures. And how do you do something like an eye blank or make the pupils move like or some of that acting thing, Eric? How do you get that performance? Because when we see Nightmare, it's going to be full of this dramatic acting. How does that work with the public that looks so... I'm getting that Nightmare. Yeah, a lot of it depends on the um, actually, because the, the, the sculptor is really defining so many things for us, mm -hmm. and then we, we figure out our methodology based on the design. So, for example, if, if an eyeball is round, well, we may be able to do something that's got round eyeballs in there, and then we can just take a pin like in the pupil and move it around. That's what we did on coral. Like that. Um, but for something like Sally, her eyes aren't round because they weren't sculpted round, and we wanted to take that part of the design. So for her, we had eyes in the pupils and a little bit of wax, and we would just put that on and move it around. For her expressions, like I say, every time that she would have a little change, we would have to replace the face or replace the body in order to get that change. Amazing. It gives you so much appreciation for the movie you're about to see today. Eric brought along a surprise movie star in for us in his backpack. One more friend that I've more friend. Friend. just come. Um, well, he's doing that Allison question, which is when sometimes we want to make the mask move. Aren't there controls in the hair or the ears or things where you just remember? These, this is Victor, this Victor and this question involved, like I said, Alan Redshift pulls the ears. Is that Alan Redshift? Yeah, Victor and his head, where he would turn in order to like make part of the face go up for a smile or the mouth to open. So those are a certain type of mechanism for the head. But like um, Sparky just has, you know, a hinged head, jaw, so that it's not, you just make a move like that. And his ears will move I'm not doing it, so don't go do it. Um, but yeah, there, you know, and what, what Eric was saying about <coughs> the eyes, Tim never wanted round eyes. His eyes are always kind of odd shaped, and, um, and so that's the only reason why we never use yeah, exactly. And while you were talking, Eric has brought up what looks like a Transformers movie thing. Any, any, anybody guess? Boogie Boogie. Yes. This, this, this was the Boogie Boogie that I used in animated for the movie. Oh. Yes. For a stop motion puppet, that's, that's quite a lot of weight. Um, so what you had to do in order to make him take a step and carry all of that weight, you had to, to take a wrench and tighten every single joint on this guy so tight that in order to animate him, I actually had to, to climb up onto the stage, grab the puppet from underneath, straddle it, straight, in order to push him over. Then climb back down, take the picture, and then keep doing that. Oh. And, <laughs> and, and, and we actually had a problem with sweat dripping and pixelating on this stage. So we just had to clean it up and let it dry before we could take the next picture. <laughs> and how long would it take you to take like a scene of a movie that was maybe five seconds long? Was that how, how long would that take you? You know, back in the day I was kind of fast. That would take about a day. A day. And, and it was shooting on film, it wasn't. That was shooting on film, yeah. Uh, which meant that, that it, it, you know, we didn't have the, the digital technology that, that exists today. Yeah. So you never saw your shot until the next day. You had no idea what you were shooting. We had um, a device called the Frame Grabber, which stored two really kind of fuzzy black and white frames. And that was the only reference that you had. Amazing. Other than that, the only way you could tell your puppet where they were is you had to put this machinist gauge in every single time. Try not to bump into the machinist gauge when you're straddling the puppet right. and moving it around. And then you can adjust the puppet <laughs> forward, take a step, do this, do 20 or 30 other things. Take the gauge out, yes. get off screen, and take the picture. And the picture is how long? Uh, 1 24th of a one second. 1 24th of a second. <laughs> yep. So you take 24 movements like that to get a second. 
Yeah, so don't blink when the show's moving. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, how about a round of applause for... I just I can't believe it. I mean, that would be uh, kind of um, armature. It's unbelievable, the physicality of it and what you need to just animate and the strength and the durability of some of the and stuff like that. Well, over here we have uh, visual effects animator Dave Bosser. Hi, Dave. How are you? It's good, John. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I've worked with Dave for many years, and Dave has worked on I can name a title from the last 25, 30 years at Disney, and he's worked on it. Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast and Lion King and Aladdin, and most recently is a producer and director at Walt Disney Feature Animation in the special projects area. So if you've seen things like the Fountain Show at Disneyland, you've seen Dave's work, it's an amazing part of the company right now. But he started out long ago as a visual effects animator on Nightmare Before Christmas. That's right. Would you tell us a little bit about what the heck that means? Well, basically, uh, it, you know, it's kind of odd. A lot of people don't realize that Nightmare Before Christmas was actually a stop motion film that was done up at the Skellington Studios outside. It was, it was in San Francisco. In San Francisco, that's right, right. yeah. And um, actually, some of the shots came down to Disney Animation. Uh, we added some snow to Halloween Town. We right. did some fire effects. We did a little bit of wire removal. Uh, a few things like that, and uh, so when Don called me, I, I actually unarchived some some shots that we had worked on, and uh, I brought a couple things along. I, I thought we could start with the fire. Let's pull them up and so see what happens. Let me, so let me get that on the screen. computer. Okay. <laughs> is that is that coming up? Yeah. Okay. There it is. Okay. There we go. All right. So um, what 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 we did with with this was. Whoever animated the, the uh, Pumpkin King, Eric, I don't know if you did it. Paul Barry. Huh? Paul Barry. Paul, okay. So they would animate this, and then we'd get those final frames down, and we'd get the film, and we'd create some paper rotos, and we actually used the paper rotos uh, uh, as our reference to create the fire animation, and this was all rendered by hand. So what we're looking at here is pencil drawings of fire? Pencil drawings of fire. That's insane. It is. So let me pull up the next clip. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what the fire looks like painted. Uh -huh. So we painted this in the cap system. All right. Yep. Now let's let me bring up the final scene. The system looks so quickly. <laughs> okay. There we go. And that's the final the final scene in the movie. So it's hand drawn fire on top. It's hand drawn. Yeah, hand drawn fire on top of hand animated puppets. Nice. This is pretty fantastic. <laughs> And it looks real. <coughs> Doesn't it look real? Yeah. Uh, the other bit that I brought along was snow. How do you do snow, right? Because you can't do stop motion snow. Can you, Eric? Allison? Come on. Right? It would take a while. You'd have them all hanging on wires. Uh, it wouldn't really work. So um, early on, uh, there really wasn't a particle system piece of software. Uh, like there is today. Right. You know, there wasn't stuff you could just go buy off the shelf and say, oh, I want to generate snow. You so, know? And now, like, it would be like frozen, how the snow would be made by a software package. Yeah, so you'd have like Houdini or the particle uh, package in Maya, right. and you'd be able to generate snow. But we didn't have that, so I worked with a very talented gentleman named Trin Juan, right. and he was a software engineer. And so he was writing software we were doing the snow for this film. And what was really kind of cool was, I said to Trin one day, gee, you know, we really got to make sure that we can choreograph this snowflake to land on the mayor's tongue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, is that something you can do? And he said, oh yeah, absolutely. I said, well, how long will it take? Is it something you can do by tomorrow? Right. And he said, well, okay. You know, and so the next day I came into work and he was all bleary eyed. And, and, and I said, Trim, like, did you spend the night here? He goes, Yeah, but I got it done. You know, and I was like, Whoa. I said, You know, you got to tell me how long these things take. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so uh, we choreographed the one snowflake and then created the field of snow with some Z gaps. So this is computer generated snow. It was all computer generated. And then, wait a second, we composited it. That was fast. Boom, look at that. <laughs> and there, and there you got snow in Halloween Town. It's amazing. No, I said we got snow in Halloween Town. <laughs> 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 so, 
brunch. We have, you know, we have this nice little bit of uh, participation in this great film that all these talented folks made up at Scout. Absolutely, that was a pleasure. Yeah, here's a jack scene with some stone as well. Like, yeah. yeah. And is this the same deal then? We're just adding trends uh, yeah. to see your snow? Yeah, and what we did here was we, we actually add, added little doily snowflakes uh -huh. mixed with just some irregular <coughs> circular shapes. Yeah. So, they so, so they're not all uh, doilies, but it's a mixture. And some, some of them are tumbling in space. And it's just, it was real fun to, to... And this is so easy to do now with the software that they have today. Not so much back 21 years ago, though. Was it that long? It was 21 years ago. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. That's great. Well, that's a, that's a little, little insight into special effects, fire, and snow from that Earth for Christmas. <laughs> as, as I'm walking over here, here's one more just because I'd like to see um, vampires play hockey with a pumpkin. <laughs> 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 Uh, next, I'd like you to meet uh, two gentlemen who are very central to the design of the movie. Uh, the, uh, the first gentleman is now a production designer in his own right on films. Back uh, 21 years ago, he was an assistant art director on Nightmare Before Christmas with Bill Bowes. Also is a production designer on films like Pirates of the Caribbean and Fargo, and won an Oscar for a film called Lemmy Snicket. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that too. Uh, and, uh, a good friend, Mr. Rick Heinrichs, is with us. So, at, at great expense and uh, at personal risk, you brought. Things from the movie. Tell us about what you brought along for us today and kind of what the job of a production designer is. I'll be happy to. Um, so, uh, when we get started on a film early on, we're taking the elements of the story and trying to get a, a visual narrative going on in our mind. On a film like this, you're of course working with the amazing um, uh, drawings and, and line of Tim Burton. And so, as uh, uh, we developed, and I'm going to show you a few things from our development for that, um, and we came to work up in the Bay Area to produce the film, we met these amazing artists, uh, including Bill, who had just a natural sensibility of being able to translate um, two-dimensional, very graphic-looking drawings into, and, and, and this is a great example of a lot of the artwork that we were creating at the time, um, you know, Bill had a certain way of, of being able to uh, read that, translate it, and um, uh, interpret it. And, um, and Bill, I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, the materials that you would use. Um, well, what was awesome about this show, this was my first movie, and I, this is still my favorite movie I worked on, but uh, we would take sketches that Tim or the artist would generate, and we would do these quick sketch models, we call them, out of cardboard. You may have seen this stuff in the neighborhood, but it was uh, an amazing uh, medium, and this is an example of one of the uh, little models that we make. Um, we would build like a scale version of the sketches. We have to translate them into 3D and uh, with, with Rick's uh, directions. Uh, we built these little team models which were then translated into the shooting sets themselves. Yeah. So this model is something you wouldn't necessarily see on the screen, no. but it's kind of a, a, a building model to workshop out yeah. ideas and shapes. You showed it to Henry Selleck, your director, and Tim, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. And you can sort of see with the architecture that we were dealing with, we were trying to, uh, you know, using a kind of a German expressionism, almost, we were twisting shapes and, and playing with forms. But it was very important to have that intermediary stage where we were turning drawings into uh, sort of three, three, two and a half dimensions. And we'll throw along some slides of the uh, pristine environment you worked in, which I think is interesting. If you can go to the slides, oh, yeah. uh, this is one of those cardboard mock-ups. Um, this is actually the set. This is uh, the, sci um, the scientist's lab set. 
It's a very forced perspective set, and you can see there's someone's head oh peeking in. And this is how it starts. It starts with just plywood and with stuff you buy at Home Depot. Is it big? This I, I, I put up here because it's, uh, what a mess. <laughs> well, here's the deal. The, the, the studio's going to get torn down at the end. So there was a sense of the fact that we could just trash this. So we did. We worked a lot of hours, and as you can see, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of supplies everywhere just to keep us busy. It's a workshop. I mean, it's really workbenches and lathes and saws and, you know, builders' supplies to try to keep it all moving. This is one of the more amazing sets, I think. Uh, that, that basically uh, would start off as a small model and then get translated into a larger shooting model. That's the back for the top. And it's all up at kind of eye level for the animators? Yeah, it's up high so the animators can get in and the motion control cameras can get in to shoot it. It's better than having it on the floor. Lock shop the little treehouse. I love doing it. He is the same video. I proposed and we got together. <laughs> this is an amazing set. It's going to be such an icon from the movie. But, um, this is made out of. It's actually a curly belt. You know, it's, it's, it's made in, in facets and planes. And every department has a, a piece, a state, and this is construction. We build it in facets. The sculpture would take over after that. And they used a hard substance that they sculpted it so we could drill it so the animators could tie down on it. I remember that the, um, just for that particular one, it was a real question as to how we were going to animate the uh, sort of opening of the spiral mount. And, um, that's something in which uh, art department and animation and everybody kind of got to get on the same page together. Whenever I see this movie, I'm always amazed at how like man-made and woman-made it is and how hand-done it is when you look at the puppets and the sculptures and everything else. Um, how eclectic was this crew? Like, what's your different talents that it takes to pull a set together and an art department together? Uh, well, it's it's uh, particularly up in San Francisco, which is a, a, a crazy town with lots of artistic people of all sexes and persuasions. <laughs> uh, the, um, it was just an intensely creative, very energetic and very dedicated group of people who, uh, uh, in fact, everybody uh, who uh, all just kind of got behind Henry and Tim and, and the film in a big way. They'd never seen anything like the movie they knew that they were going to be making before. And just the, all the heart that went into it was um, it's just up there on the screen. Uh, it really comes across. Yeah, as you were mentioning, Tim, uh, you were along with you, uh, Rick, to some of Tim's drawings and some of the things you've been through uh, yes. with him. May I? Here go through. Thank you. So I just I just wanted to give a little bit of a, a history of the stuff that sort of came up uh, prior to um, Nightmare Before Christmas. It was kind of a development period in which Tim and I were um, uh, coming up with uh, graphic images and, and turning them into puppets and playing around with the idea of uh, how do <coughs> these characters uh, look when you actually put them in light and in space? This is a very disturbing image to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's the thing about Tim's work is that there's always something underneath the surface. Uh, sometimes monstrous, but oftentimes uh, kind of delightful and fun as well. Look at that. Uh, so as you can see, a lot of the themes that went into Nightmare Before Christmas were in there early on. So these are all my sculptures and Tim's drawings. Yeah, he, would, uh, he would do these sort of lovely little images, very simple, very uh, concept and, and uh, idea oriented. Um, and the beauty of it was that there was so much there that, that you could add to. So I would do a sculpture so we, we created a costume character. And so, um, around this time, we came up, uh, Tim came up with the idea of a storybook. He called it Vincent. I happened to do sculpture and animation, and it was my idea to, hey, let's do a stop motion animation test using these characters. I, I said that in there just because I knew you would like to see what we could Tim look like uh, a few years ago. And here they are now. Oh, 
we've uh, developed this guy for a, a Halloween-oriented project, which can design the characters of Ori conceptualized. Well, basically, the, the way that we work is that I'll do a drawing, something like this, and from that, Rick will make a sculpture of it, like this, and then from there, we'll build it into a, a live set. Another project that Tim and I worked on together was an experimental stop-motion animation for which uh, I took Tim's designs and created puppets in three-dimensional sets. Vincent Malloy is seven years old. He's always polite and does what he's told. It's a six-minute short called Vincent, about a young boy who longs to be just like Vincent Price. Created by two new generation Disney animators, Tim Burton and Rick Hanricks, it's a macabre tale where the boy dreams of performing fiendish experiments on his dog, dipping his aunt in hot wax, and being kept prisoner in his dark and dank tower bedroom. It's narrated by the king of horror himself. It's taken, I think, from a lot of different kinds of characters that I, that I played, all of which have had a kind of tongue-in-cheek quality about them. Wow, that was so... Uh... Based on our experience with Vincent, we were very excited about this next idea that Tim had about a, uh, a joyous skeleton, this, this happy little ghost dog, uh, which was pitched to different uh, networks as a half-hour television special. This is in the early 80s. Um, and nobody bit because it was too weird for them. <laughs> And it, was, it, it took uh, a number of years and for Tim to become an A-list director for them to take a second look at the property and decide uh, that they were going to turn it into a feature film. Um, so a lot of the, uh, the back and forth that we would uh, do with uh, all of the designers, <coughs> artists, animators uh, up in the Bay Area, um, we sort of came up with this um, working process of drawings to sort of dimensional 2D drawings to, um, to, to like three-dimensional um, And uh, these are some of the, I think the art department models are still on there. So we would, we would do full-on art department models first as we were translating it. And those would get then developed in the sets that the animators, um, uh, Eric and the guys could um, and just a lot of notes back and forth. This is an early Sally. An early Sally. She was a little too sexy. So Tim redrew it, very simple drawing, and uh, we translated that. And uh, she's beautiful. And, then, and that's how she developed into the puppet we all know about. I wanted to say one thing also um, about Eric Layton. God love the guy. When I brought my sculpture of Jack Skelling to him, he kind of blanched a little bit because the legs were so skinny. But he just uh, took it as a personal challenge with our um, armature maker, um, San Juan, San Juan, uh, to, to just figure out how do we do it. And um, they did it. They did such a great job. They kept the, the design intact. And um, it's such a wonderful combination, I, I felt, of these different disciplines kind of coming together. And, uh, if we hadn't stuck to it, we wouldn't have had your heart. We wouldn't have we had to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to mention, uh, uh, to our good friend Joe Ramp, um, I went to school with Joe, we went through Disney together, uh, he was the head of story on Nightmare Before Christmas, he went on to be the head of story in a little film called Toy Story, I thought it became a fixture uh, and an essential creative figure at Pixar, um, regrettably died several years ago, um, and we miss Joe. Together, um, and by we, I mean these amazing people up here. So let's hear it one more time for our guest. <laughs>
continuous years, the Nightmare Before Christmas has returned for a special engagement each and every Halloween season. That's 21 years of devoted moviegoers experiencing this special film on the big screen. I also had the thrill of introducing my nine-year-old to the Haunted Mansion holiday at Disneyland for the first time. Afterwards, I did a little reading from the opening of the Nightmare Before Christmas that I think you might enjoy. "'Twas a long time ago, longer now than it seems, in a place that perhaps you have seen in your dreams. For the story that you are about to be told began with the holiday of worlds of old. Now you've probably wondered where holidays come from. If you haven't, I'd say that it's time you'd be done. For the holidays are the result of much fuss and hard work for the worlds that create them for us. Well, you see now, quite simply, that's all that they do. 
making one unique holiday especially for you. What once a calamity ever so great occurred when two holidays met by mistake. This film is very personal and very close to my heart. Please enjoy the screening. I am the Pumpkin King! <laughs> Thank you for coming tonight and enjoy it. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen, at the Nightmare Before Christmas. Woo! 